Um, the unemployment numbers that we're seeing are sort of skewed towards renters, if, if you look on this slide. So what? who are these renters? Well, they're generally young adults. Look at that, the, the highest number of unemployment rate is really pretty young people. And those young people do have the ability to move back in with mom and dad um, or live with friends. You know, my daughter lives with three friends to, you know, they're, rent, they're sharing rooms in San Diego. It's cheap. They're, she said her, you know, her whole apartment's about the size of one of our, you know, like our kitchen or whatever. It's tiny, but they're happy. They're all living together. Um, it's cheap. So young adults have a little more flexibility. They can go sleep on someone's couch. They can go back with mom and dad. They can bunk up with their friends. So will the, this, the unemployment with young people really affect the housing market? Probably not. They, they don't own homes, most likely. So there won't be an impact there. Now, do they, will it affect, affect certain rentals? Yeah, it very well could affect certain rentals. And that's what's important to, to look at. Who are you renting to? We also know, once again, these poor millennials are the most vulnerable to the situation here today. These millennials went through the last one. They got out of college during the last recession, had a hard time getting jobs back then, got a late start, and bam, they're getting hit again. So um, the cities that have the most millennial share might get hit the hardest, uh, potentially. And you can see these again. These are the cities that that have more millennials. And job losses are by category. What we know is that people are still spending money. They're just spending it differently. A lot of us realize, you know, maybe it's not so much fun to go to a crowded restaurant where you can barely hear each other and you have to wait for your food. And maybe maybe we just order it to go. Or we, um, Rich and I have been ordering this thing called territory where they just bring the meals to your house. Restaurants, restaurants are rethinking how they do business. They've got these beautiful kitchens that are closed between 10 p.m. and 6 a.m. or 10 a.m. or whatever, they're closed for 50% for of the time. Well, what if they came in at night, prepared meals, and prepared their favorite menus, and people just ordered it, and it's delivered? That's what we do. We have our meals delivered, like eight at a time on Monday and then on Thursday, and we don't go out anymore, and we're saving so much money that way. So there's all kinds of ways that jobs are shifting. It's been very interesting to see, but that's how entrepreneurs are. They got to get creative and they are. And uh, people have to get creative and we are. So the distressed industries, we already know what those are. You see that, um, but look at the green, the, the growing industries. So there are job losses, but hopefully people are being retrained and going into new industries. Um, one of the big effects of COVID is the spike in lumber prices that's driving construction costs up. I just did an interview on the Real Wall Show. Definitely listen to that. It's with the chief economist of the National Association of Home Builders. And, uh, you know, we were in agreement about this, that costs are going up. Costs have been going up to build new homes. And that affects the price of existing homes. It kind of brings it up when you've got a neighborhood with a few lots that end up getting new homes on them and those homes cost more, it can bring up the price of the existing homes in the area. So the spike in, um, again, we're, we're seeing about $16,000 added price to, the, to a new home. So um, today, I, I do believe, this is, this is kind of, uh, let me start over. <laughs> to summarize where I think we are today, I really don't think it's that different than my strategy back in 2005 when I started, when Real Wealth kind of was born. Uh, I, and I had the Real Wealth show and I interviewed Robert Kiyosaki and he was seeing, wow, you know, California prices have gone up so much. It's a great time to cash in, take all that equity and invest it somewhere else and increase your cash flow. Diversify a little bit more. You can sell one property and buy five or 10 elsewhere diversified. Um, you could follow the demographics, get into more affordable places, increase your cash flow substantially, and get into areas that are just at the beginning of their growth cycle. I learned a lot of this in 2005 from Robert Kiyosaki, and it's the same plan today. And I'm so thrilled about that. I'm thrilled to discover that here we are in such unprecedented times, scary times, but the plan that worked 15 years ago still works today. If you do it right, if you stick with the fundamentals and you play their game. This is not 
not a game any of us would have come up with. There's a lot of financial engineering that's out of our control. And you can be mad, you can vote against it or for it, it doesn't matter. It's out of our control, I hate to say it. So you gotta learn the game. I, you gotta learn the game. So I learned it from Kiyosaki and, and I've been sharing it with you know, our members at Real Wealth ever since. And so this is an example of a property that we bought in 2005 when that was the peak of the market everyone was like you're you know why would you buy and looking back why would you buy in 2005 and 2006 it was the peak of the market most people were buying because they were hoping that prices would continue to rise that's a terrible terrible reason to to buy unless you're getting it so cheap that it doesn't make sense but 2005 you weren't um but this was cheap to me and this is what kiyosaki told me he was doing and if it was good enough for him we were doing it too so rich and i went to dallas we came back with five of these properties they were between 120 and 140 150 thousand brand new uh they were around the one percent rent you know came in around one percent um the difference is the huge difference for me between now and then because we were still kind of buying at the peak but we were buying in an area that was growing that was still very very low priced compared to the rest of the country Again, this property in California would have been a couple million, you know, not 145,000. So to me, this was incredibly cheap, but it was near new infrastructure, new roads, um, you know, great schools. So the difference is we were paying about six to seven, I think in some cases even 8% interest. So we had to get interest only loans. Uh, that made the cash flow like break even. It, it was not a great deal. It wasn't, I talk about these a lot, but it wasn't as great a deal as it maybe sounds because even at the 1% rent to, to a price ratio, it, it, we weren't cash flowing incredibly because the property taxes were so high and the interest rate was so high. So you fast forward to today and you can still buy properties at this price. $150,000. You can buy, you can pay less than that. You could still pay $100,000 in some areas. You might pay $200,000, but we're talking 15 years later than when Rich and I started. You can still find areas of the country that are growing in the same way that this little town was growing. The difference is you can pay about half the interest rate that we were paying. And, and if you get in certain areas, the property taxes are way lower too. So you can actually get into the market today and cash flow better than when I started. And that was that's amazing to me. That's the opportunity. So even though it's scary, it was scary back then too. I mean, it was the top of the market, right? But these properties in, in Rockwall, Texas, they stayed rented through the entire recession. Rents went up. And then the values of these properties tripled. So every year we were getting cash flow, we were getting more rent, you know, higher rents and properties tripled in value. Unfortunately, we sold them before they tripled in value. So hold, buy and hold. It's called buy and hold for a reason, a hold. Um, yeah, we, we probably would have made $5 million or something if we had just held those. But we're like, oh, you know, the, the cash flow has been okay. They just aren't going up in value. And then as soon as we sold them, they went up. Anyway, you have an incredible opportunity to do this today. And uh, I'll show you some slides in a bit. If you didn't see our virtual live event on Saturday, definitely go watch it because you're going to see samples of properties not quite as beautiful as this. I mean, some are, um, but around the same price point, maybe a little bit higher in markets that are showing some of the same signs uh, that Texas was showing at the time, only the property taxes are lower. I still like parts of Texas. Uh, I still, you know, like Houston and, and Dallas, they're great markets. It's just you do have that property tax issue, although a lot of our teams have workarounds. So be sure to watch the uh, the recorded webinar. Since the last recession, so since I bought, we've had 23 million more Americans. So we've got household formation. We've got population growth. Um, so again, you still have today. 15 years later, this opportunity to, to get cash flowing properties, brand new if you want, with the potential for appreciation. I think pretty serious appreciation based on what I showed you with 
the amount of monetary stimulus, the devaluing of the dollar, which will in, most likely increase asset values. I just, I think you almost have a better chance of building a portfolio today than when I started. What are the things to be aware of? This is a big one. Government policy is really important to pay attention to over the next coming months. Because like I said, there's been all kinds of government policy that if you asked me a year ago if it was possible, I would have said no way, not not in the US. But you know, like I said, in LA, um, if you wanted to open your business, they were they would just turn off the, the lights, they turn off the electricity and the water. You, you you couldn't do it. So that to me is unprecedented. Um, you get arrested for opening up your business, you get arrested for going to church. I mean, it's it's just government policy we've never seen. I understand the reasons we've never seen a pandemic either. Um, but the, this is why we've got to pay attention to the what ifs and make sure that we're really buying right. Um, what we found, well, I think I've got a slide on it. There could be a flood of evictions. Um, there are people who, once that eviction moratorium is lifted, will be affected. Um, but the, the, there are a lot of people that won't be at all. There's what 70 million people that won't be affected. So that's good. Hopefully you have one of those properties. And there's about 28 million that will be, that are going to have a really tough time unless they can get retrained in a new industry. And I think that's the biggest opportunity right now is, is training people for new jobs, jobs of the future, so that they're not stuck in this orange section of, you know, at risk. Uh, but you, as a property owner, you want to be really careful to make sure that you're getting tenants who won't be affected. And because, again, if you watch the the webinar of the live event, you'll see that our property managers are very aware of um, bringing in tenants who have stable jobs. Here's something to be super aware of that um, will affect multifamily. I don't believe that single family is going to be very affected in the in the years ahead. I, I really don't. All I see is growth there, rent growth, and there's just not enough of it. We're so undersupplied in one to four units. And there's so much demand for it. Never before has there been a time when people so want to have their own space. They want more space. They want yards. They want an office. They want a playroom. They want a home gym. I mean, all these things uh, that you can get in the suburbs in a single family home. And they're paying less with low mortgage rates. And uh, they're able to pay less than what they were paying living in the cities. And they many people can live anywhere now. Um, but what we have is a lot of developers who did not see this coming, of course, and we're building all these beautiful high-rise buildings in downtown areas that used to be cool, but it's not cool anymore. It's not cool to live downtown if you can't go out to eat or you can't go watch entertainment, you can't hang out with people. I mean, what's the point? So uh, unfortunately, the timing is pretty terrible for all of these record multifamilies coming online. That's my personal opinion. Um, it's also the opinion of a lot of people I've interviewed on the Real Wealth Show that these A-class properties that are coming online and it's bigger than in 1970 when there was a flood of multifamily back then, all these new A-class buildings, well, their rents are going to go down. And when A-class rents go down, that affects B-class and that affects C-class. So I do believe over the next year, there's going to be some really great opportunity in multifamily. So we'll be keeping an eye on that. Uh, we've hired an asset manager because we're going to start looking at multifamily. Uh, I didn't see anything that it, it felt way too risky for the last few years. They're just, it just felt really risky to me. Uh, but now I think there's that opportunity. So we'll be definitely be paying attention. We'll be looking for good asset managers and good underwriters. So definitely reach out if, if that's you. And I uh, just want to let you know that um, next week we have an upcoming webinar on uh, that our investment counselors will be doing and talking about how real estate has changed for them, uh, what they've seen over the years and uh, in their own investments and sharing that information with you. And they've been putting that together. So I think it's going to be a really interesting thing. I kind of brought it up on our uh, content meeting. I said, Ben, you know, you have 30 years experience as a real estate investor. I'd be so curious what it looks like today compared to last decade or the decade before, you know, the kind of things you were buying then and what you're seeing now. And the, and I, I mentioned Texas. I was like, you know, it's amazing that it, it not necessarily in Dallas, Texas, not in Rockwell, but in certain parts of the country, the Southeast specifically, 
that you can do even better today than I did 15 years ago because of low interest rates and, and low prices and incredible demand and low supply. I mean, like, oh, it's like a perfect storm. So our investment counselors are going to be sharing their insights and, and uh, their years of history and the changes that they're seeing. Um, again, so what's next? Keep an eye out for an email with links to that uh, last weekend's live event. We'll be sending that just because you registered, we'll be able to send that out to you. And um, if you haven't watched it, I really recommend it. I led a panel with um, a bunch of our real wealth, I think three of our real, real wealth members to talk about investing out of state and buying existing homes versus new homes and, and which markets. Uh, which markets have worked out best for them. So that panel is like 45 minutes. That's at the beginning. And then Leah, one of our investment counselors, takes us through. He talked to several different uh, property managers and new build, uh, basically uh, property teams who offer um, new builds, build for rent to members. So uh, that's that's kind of the hot thing. That's what tenants want. They want a brand new, clean, fresh place to live in. Um, so yeah, check that out and uh, don't miss out on the new construction opportunities in Florida. That's that's the other thing. Prices are going up. So they're going up already um, by like $5,000, but they're going to keep going up. So I think this window of opportunity to actually cash flow on a new home is a very small window. So if you were thinking about doing it, I would jump on it really soon uh, because as prices go up, it's just not going to cash flow as well as it as it would today. Um, we will see probably an uptick in foreclosures, but uh, I didn't add that slide. Shoot, I, I got to find that slide. But um, I wouldn't freak out about a bunch of foreclosures coming online because there, there will be some. But for the most part, these loan forbearances, the mortgage forbearances, uh, they're, they're going to be, they've already been extended. And then they're most likely going to go into loan modifications and just get paid at the end of the loan. So if you had a, if you had, 30 months left, you're going to have 35 months left on uh, on your loan or what, however that that works. It's just, in my opinion, there's going to be um, more forgiveness over the next few months because the banks don't want to see a bunch of foreclosures. With that said, there will be more. And the good news for that is that means that our teams around the country that are able to find properties at a discount, renovate them and offer them to our members as you know, renovated rental properties, they're going to be finding more of those. So as new homes get more and more expensive and the cash flow gets worse over time, uh, they, there will be the opportunity to buy existing homes, you know, the foreclosures that, uh, that will be cheaper. They're just not on the market yet. It'll probably be, I don't know, six to seven months before we see that happen, maybe longer if at all, and it won't be anything like 2008. I'm sorry to break that to you if you're waiting for that. 